pastor uh, had asked me to minister tonight, and then he had asked me also to, when I did minister, uh, to minister on uh, the subject of prayer. And so the last two sessions that we've had, uh, we've done so uh, in that, and uh, we'll do that tonight as well. And uh, so um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a few things. We're going to look at characteristics of people who pray. And I may say, say it a little different characteristics of, of a prayer or a person who prays. And um, so there was a, there's one of our instructors, she wrote a book and in her book, she talked about the first advent of Christ. So when Jesus was coming the very first time, uh, he was scheduled and planned uh, uh, from the foundations of the world. And, um, and so uh, it talks about all the prophecies that came. And we know that in Genesis chapter 3, that uh, the Lord said to Adam and Eve and to the, uh, the serpent, that there will be a redeemer coming. There will be one that's coming that he's going to, you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. Hallelujah. And so that was the first prophetic word that we see regarding the redeemer coming. So in Jesus's first coming, it involved people that helped prepare the way of the Lord to come. And so we look uh, at people like Mary. You think Mary was involved in Jesus coming the first time? <laughs> just a wee bit, just a little bit. So we see Jesus' mother. She was a young woman uh, of grace and character, handpicked by God, and uh, to prepare her for this amazing uh, opportunity to carry uh, the plan of God. Hallelujah. And then Joseph, uh, his father, uh, there was um, that he was not his biological father, uh, but God handpicked him and chose him. You know, if you think about it, Joseph could have exploited this opportunity because of the things that he knew ahead of time, you know, things that Mary told him because uh, she was a spouse to him. He could have, you know, uh, made money off of it and all that stuff. But God saw character in him enough to trust him to raise the plan of God Amen. and that he would watch over it and take care of it. There are other folks that were involved, Zacharias and Elizabeth, uh, in their old age. Uh, they had an important part in Jesus coming the first time, uh, birthing John the Baptist, uh, who was to be, uh, of course, Jesus' cousin, but also the forerunner that went before him to say, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is the Christ, the living God. And, uh, and so we see other folks, the wise men were involved, the shepherds were involved. Uh, and then we're going to look at two characters that were very involved in the preparation uh, of Jesus coming back again. And that is Anna and Simeon. We see that they were people of prayer. Uh, we get a glimpse of them in scripture towards the end of their life. We don't see a whole lot in the, uh, in the beginnings of their life. It says that Anna prayed in the temple many years that she had been given, uh, she given herself to prayer in the temple after she was widowed uh, and she prayed for this coming event of Jesus coming into the earth. And Simeon did the same thing. He was devoted to prayer in the temple as well. So we're gonna look at these characteristics of these two people and they are things that we can apply to ourselves. Amen. And uh, so characteristics are features or that help identify or tell apart or distinguish us from things, Disting distinguishing marks or traits um, of people uh, that set them apart. And so uh, we see these characters in Simeon and Anna that uh, should be in all people. So when we look at this passage tonight, these are things that should be in all of us uh, as the word is telling us this. And I was reading through this one time and the Lord just began to detail out to me all these different uh, things of characteristics about them. Now, uh, we're going to go to Luke chapter 2 and we're going to start in verse 21. So you can go ahead and turn there if you want, but uh, I'll just mention this as we're getting ready to go ahead and go on. In Luke chapter 1, verses 1, 8 through 10, it talks about that the priests were gathering together. And then in verse 10, I think, I don't know, Wesley, can you put up uh, Luke 1, 10? Luke 1, 10. And it talks about, this is in the temple, uh, the whole multitude of people were praying without a time, uh, without, 
at the time of incense, where they were praying outside at the time of incense. And so there was a prayer meeting going on at the temple. Can you imagine that? And, uh, and then uh, we see some things about Simeon uh, and Anna coming up. So back to Luke chapter 2, verse 21. And so I'm going to read uh, a large portion of scripture here, and then we're going to go back and we're going to pick out the characteristics of them. All right? All right? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. So uh, in uh, Luke 2, 21... Uh, and when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, was completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two pigeons. Verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the spirit into the temple and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed him and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marvel at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, and, he, and, he, and the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, of the daughter of Phanuah, and the, of the tribe of Asher. And she was of a great age and had lived at, uh, with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of now 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers day and night, or night and day. And coming in the instant, she gave, uh, gave thanks to the Lord and spoke to him to all those who looked for redemption in Israel. So when they have performed all these things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own, uh, their own city, Nazareth. So as we're reading through there, there are some uh, traits, as, uh, um, uh, what do you want to call it? Uh, characteristics, whatever you want to say, about these two people in the preparation of Jesus coming the first time. So let's go back and um, look. So one of the things that it says about Simeon is that he was just and devout. And that word devout there means that he was given to the word. That he was given to the word. So people who pray should be given to the word. Hallelujah. Uh, for those that came to summer prayer clinic or that were online, man, we hammered on this quite a bit about the word being first place, it being our foundation. And so let's look at Proverbs 4, 20 and through 24. My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear to my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So apart from the word, there is no prayer. The word of God is our foundation. You know, I've been around people who say, you know, I just like to just flow with the spirit. I just want to flow with the spirit. You're trying to uh, box me in. You're trying to, uh, um, uh, you know. Uh, put me in bondage. That's the big word. You're trying to put me in bondage. But the word is freeing. <laughs> and the word of God also, uh, as I said to the, the, the prayer group uh, when we were praying, 
or this summer, uh, that the word of God tethers us. So you can fly high with him, uh, you know, like with a kite. The kite can go real high, but if you, it's not tethered to something, you say, bye-bye, kite. But when it's tethered to something, when we're tethered to the word of God, we're grounded and we have a foundation. And man, you can fly in the spirit because the word and the spirit agree. So, uh, so the word of God is our foundation. In Colossians 3.16, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. So it's telling us we need to pack it in. We need to have the word of God in our house. And so um, uh, prayer is finding out what the will of God is and breathing it back to him. Finding out what his, his will is by the word and also finding out about the spirit. Then we're going to talk about that in just a minute. So how do we know what the will of God is? It's his word. His will and his word are one. So if we want to know the will of God, look in the word of God. Hallelujah. So people who pray uh, that stay with the word, uh, that don't stay with the word, become uh, granola Christians. Fruit, flakes, and nuts. <laughs> and we don't want to be in that category, right? <clears throat> Do you know anybody? Don't look at your neighbor. Or been around, you know, especially, you know, early on in charismata. Uh, well, I was around some fruit flakes and nuts. Hallelujah. You know, people who, again, you're trying to put me in bondage. But no, the word of God is our safe place. Hallelujah. And so uh, what is the word of God? What is truth? John 17, 17 says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And the word also talks about the spirit of truth. So the spirit of truth works with the word of truth. And so we are anchored to that. Amen. So if we follow the Holy Spirit who guides us through the word, then your heart will be trained to follow him out into the spirit realm. So if you can follow him through the word of God, you're sitting down studying and uh, you're studying a, a particular subject or passage or something. If you can follow him in the pages of the word of God, you can follow him out there because he's a safe guy. Hallelujah. And that's why we tether ourselves to him. One of the best ways to know that you're following the spirit of truth is to immerse yourself in the truth, which is the word of God. So we get acquainted with the word. We get to know the word. And then knowing the word when other things come up or doctrines that come up or uh, uh, wrong things come up, you know, no, that's not the word of God. When I was living in Nashville years ago, <clears throat> I was getting ready for church one Sunday morning. There was a huge denominational church that came on, uh, you know, right before I would leave the house. And so I was watching something else, and then it came on after. And, uh, <laughs> and they came on to said, and the pastor was preaching. And he came on and he said, uh, you know, uh, we don't know why God heals some people and he don't heal others. And, uh, and we, you know, this big mysterious... Uh, you know, we can't know the will of God regarding all that. And I started screaming from my bathroom. That's not my father. That's not what the word of God says. And so, you know, so you can know when you hear stuff, you can just filter it out. Right. Nope. That's not truth. I'm not abiding by that. Nope. That's not truth. I'm not taking that in. Click. That's not true. Turn to another change channels. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So you, the word of God becomes your filter then. So, and then uh, in John, 1 John 2, 27, it talks about the Holy Spirit being the teacher. And he teaches us. So when we hear the word of God, when we hear people minister and all that kind of stuff, we can fit, uh, filter out those things because the great teacher is on the inside of us. That is even what happens when we're up here teaching. And, uh, and then I've had people come up and say, uh, you know, you said this. Thank you for when you said this during your message. And I go, I didn't say that. Who said it? The Holy Ghost. And so the Holy Ghost is a teacher beyond what comes out of my mouth or the teacher or whoever's up here ministering. Besides what comes out of our mouth, you've got the teacher on the inside. Hallelujah. And so beside, well, we could be teaching on marriage and you can get something on your finances while you're sitting here because the teacher, your heart's open and the teacher will teach you. Right. Hallelujah. And get your answers. And then, you know, uh, uh, Pastor Mark talked about how he would go back to his church when he was itinerated to get all his questions answered. And the person go, I don't know why I'm saying this. 
because your faith is reaching out to the spirit of God for answers. Glory to God. And he will give you the answers. So glory to God. So the word and the spirit agree. Hallelujah. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to give you a few little uh, statistics here. And I can't do this with all the, the areas that we're going to cover with Anna and Simeon today. Um, so I'm going to try to make this very quickly. I hear tell that school starts tomorrow. <laughs> Hallelujah. Short summer. Short summer. So we're going to try to get you out of here. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so a fr the further a person who prays, or basically just a Christian, if you're a Christian, you can pray because you've got the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. Uh, the, so the further a, pray, a person who prays goes in prayer, the further he or she must go in the word. So Barna did this study uh, and they did it for the International Bible Society of 95,000 people in the U.S. They said that over 30 million people out of 300 million that are in the U.S., that uh, since 2000, since the year 2000, one out of every 10 person has walked away from their faith. One out of 10 people have walked away from their faith since the year 2000. Uh, they went to church and they don't go to church regularly anymore. They prayed regularly, but they don't pray anymore. Many of them are now practicing agnostics, atheists, or spiritualists. Not many of them ever said that they would walk away from their faith. They believed and they were sincere in their faith. But now they've found themselves drifting. Uh, so it says that if you don't consciously pursue God, you're going to drift or um, go with the current of this current world. So one of the things they found out that people stop feeding themselves in the word. They stop feeding themselves on the word. Not necessarily you got your Bible out while we're in church right now, but outside of these four walls during the week, they don't go to their Bible and study their Bible. They don't read their, the word. I'm going to give you some statistics here in just a second. Acts chapter 20, verses 25 through 27 says, and now I know that this is Paul talking. And he said, and now I know that none of you uh, to whom I have preached the kingdom will ever see me again. So he's telling them, there's a chance you won't ever see me again. I declare today that I have been faithful. So Paul is saying, I've been faithful to teach you the word. I've been faithful to get to you the things of God. And he says, if anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault. So he's saying in the churches or in the Bible studies that I have, I've given you the word. I've taught you the word. I've given you the mystery, the revelation that God has given me. And he says, outside of that, it's not my fault. If, you're, if you don't make it, <laughs> and you fail in life, it's not my fault because I gave you the word. And so he said, it's not my fault for I didn't shrink from declaring all that God wants you to know. Uh, the modern English translation says of that last verse, for I did not keep from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. So Paul is saying, I taught you everything that I knew of the whole counsel of God. And so if you falter in your faith, if you don't make it or you go away from Christ or you leave uh, your faith, it's not my fault. And you know that this is one meal that you get on church on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock or 11 or a saturation meeting or on Wednesday night. This is just one meal. You still got five days, five other days. Uh, to feed. Amen. So if this is all we're getting in a week, uh, what if you did that in your life? You just ate on Sunday. You'd be shrinking away, right? Hallelujah. So we need to be feeding on the word outside of uh, what we get at church. And, uh, <clears throat> and this, uh, so it goes on to say that these people were saying or they weren't saying or thinking I can go to church on Sunday and hear an inspiring message and I'm going to be fine. I have friends who believe the same way that I do. They're Christians so I'll be okay. I can go once a week, maybe once a month and everything's going to be fine. It just got real quiet right there. <clears throat> We are told because of how viciously 
and wicked and deceptive that the enemy is, that we need to exhort each other, and the word admonishes this, exhort each other daily. We have to be rooted and grounded in the word of God, in the truth of God's word. In Acts chapter 20, verse 32, Paul says this, so now, brother, I commend you to God. So he said, you know, I've done everything that I know to do. If you don't see me again, what I taught you, what I've downloaded to you, now I'm handing you off to God. And uh, who's God on the earth that's here with us? The Holy Spirit. So he's handing us off to the Holy Spirit and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So he said, I taught you. You know how to go to the word. You know what the word of God says, what I've accounted unto you. And he's saying, now I commend you to God. And so what builds us up? The word of God. What gives us or tells us about our inheritance? We would not know anything about what we have, what we can do, what we, the power that we can operate in if it wasn't for the word of God. So this is a part of their, their study. So another study that they did where 2,000 people were polled. It said 52% say they never read their Bible. 8% say they read their Bible three to four times a year. 6% read their Bible to, uh, once a month. 8% read their Bibles once a week. 13% read their Bibles several times a week. 14% read their Bibles every day. So 14% of this poll of people read their Bible every day. So going to church is one thing, but if we, and being a lot around like-minded believers is, a, is another thing, but we need our mind renewed Amen. Amen. to the word of God. Brother Hagen, uh, he uh, was in an interview on TBN many, many years ago, and I watched, uh, watched it. And so the interview was asking him, him a question. And he said, Brother Hagen, what is the greatest need of the church today? And his reply was, the greatest need of the church today is a renewed mind. Amen. Why? Because if we go the current, the, the way or the current of this, this world system, we go the way of culture, we're drifting far and farther away from the truths of the word of God. And so we need uh, to come back and recalibrate to the word of God. If you see something, uh, they're saying there's recession or inflation and all this stuff going on in your finance. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. There's another pandemic on the horizon. You know, you need to get your mask out again. You need to get your PPEs and all that. Uh, I'm uh, healed by the stripes of Jesus. And we come back to the, and it's not the word that we heard yesterday. It's the word that we hear today. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Yes. And so, and that, that's what uh, Proverbs 4 kept saying, that you keep it before your eyes. You give it its attention. Uh, uh, what did jo uh, Joshua say? If we meditate in it day and night, we're going to success, right, in our life. If we want to have success in our finances, if we want to have sex, uh, success, success with our children, if we want to have success in our lives, we tether ourselves to the word of God Amen. glory to God but there uh there's something different about that being that your Bible reading your Bible in our own private time yeah. Yeah. and it's great that we read it at church and we follow along on the screens and on our devices and all of that but is this past Sunday the last time you looked at it hallelujah There is a shift that happens in our mind when we read the word three times a week. So there, even in the study, they're saying that there's a shift. If you uh, uh, immerse yourself in the word, at least, I, I said it's four times a week. It rewrites your thought patterns. And it also said that 96% of the decisions that we make in life are done unconsciously. 96% of the decisions that we make in life are done unconsciously. 
So if we're not recalibrating back to the word, that means culture, that means whatever uh, is, uh, we're taking in, that means if we're sitting and watching ENN, uh, ENN, CNN or Fox or NBC, ABC, CBS and all the alphabets, we're taking in that and unconsciously we're making decisions according to what we're taking in. But if we're not taking in the word of God to combat that and renew our minds to the word of God, we're not making decisions according to the truth of the word of God or the spirit of God. So we're drifting away. I don't know if you've ever done this uh, in a boat or uh, been out on the ocean and you can see the shoreline and you look away for just a minute and you look back and you can't see it anymore. Why? Because you're drifting. And when we don't calibrate or recalibrate with the word, we're drifting. We're drifting away from what we know. And sometimes we don't even know we've, we are far away. Until it's too late, until we need something, until some, that we need something to happen in our lives. Hallelujah. So Hebrews 2, 1 says, so we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard or we may drift away from it. So we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard or we may drift away from it. So this world is under the influence of the evil one. Remember the word says that he's the prince of the power of the air? That uh, we've been learning about our dominion and how Adam and Eve turned over their dominion, their authority over to the enemy. So he's ruling and reigning down here. And so uh, in order to be effective in our Christian life, we're going to have to uh, adhere ourselves to the word of God in order to combat what the enemy is doing. So we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard or we may drift away from it, according to Hebrews 2.1. Uh, let's see here. Let's see. Second Timothy two, uh, 15 tells us that we should study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed. And it also, uh, in this study, it said that people said that the word of God was boring. They said that the word of God, uh, they lacked understanding regarding the word of God and that it was not relevant to today. And so that's the mantra of the day that it's, it's an antiquated book and it's not relevant to what we're going through. We're going to read the New Reader's Digest or we're going to read Psychology Today or whatever it is to get our answers for our life instead of something that's tried and true. <laughs> tried and true. Uh, I forget, I think it was Voltaire uh, that said uh, that... Uh, I think he tried to get rid of the word of God. He wouldn't, uh, he, uh, and even in his death, that those that were, were around him, he was screaming. He was seeing the fires of hell, and he's screaming. And all his life he had said that, the, you know, the Bible wasn't true, it's, not, it's antiquated, it's not relevant of the day. And they said they could hear screams coming to his room. And he had asked for a Bible, and they refused to bring a Bible in there. And in the home that he died in, a hundred years later became uh, a Bible society, a place where they printed Bibles. So uh, he said that it was antiquated and it wouldn't last, but it outlasted him. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. This, this word of God that we preach is tried and true. It's been around for a long time. And so, and we can trust it. Uh, Psalm 119, uh, 18 says, open mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things in your law. So if the word is boring to you, if it's lacking understanding, if it's not relevant, you think it's not relevant for today, ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes. That's what David prayed here. Open my eyes that I might see wondrous things in your word. And, uh, you know, I, you need that when you're going through Leviticus. When you're going through Deuteronomy, you know, when, especially in Leviticus, you know, when you go, uh, you know, uh, all the cleanliness laws, you know, uh, a hair with a boil in it, or if you're bald, do this, and all those kinds of things. Lord, why is this relevant to us today? And you have to ask the Holy Spirit to help you through that. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 1, 17 and 18, we know that around here. For always pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he may grant to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and insight into mysteries and secrets in the deep and intimate knowledge of him. 
And who is him? Him is the word. John 1 tells us that he was the word made flesh. So when we're getting a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, we're getting a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of the word. Who he is. And then Philippians talks about how uh, Paul said, my determined purpose uh, is to know him and the wonders of his person. And to get to know him more intimately and more acquainted. Hallelujah. And then verse 18 says, by the heaven, our eyes of our heart un, uh, flooded with light. So if we want to get to know the word, ask him to help you. Ask the Holy Spirit who, help, who moved on holy men of old to pen this word. What did you mean by that? And there may be some things that we, on this side of heaven we may not know. But the things that are probably relevant for our everyday life, he can tell you that. Praise the Lord. So if we're not constantly recalibrating our lives to the word, we drift away. Hallelujah. Truth, the word, works no matter what culture is like. So the word of God is tried and true. It's been around for a long time. Culture is variable. It changes from one generation to the next, sometimes several times in a generation. So the word of God is tried and true. So Simeon was just and devout, and he was a man given to the word. And we see how important that is, especially even now as we see the day approaching. Hallelujah. The word of God is even more, uh, means more to us. So another characteristic of Simeon, I got a rock and roll here. He, it says he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. So people who pray or Christians, uh, part of the traits that they have is that they have the fruit of the spirit operating in their life. So they're patient. And so Galatians tells us in Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering. Hallelujah. And uh, gentleness, goodness, Faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. So, um, and this is hard for people who pray. Because, you know, you're in a, a, a realm uh, in the spirit where things are more real to you than, you know, us look at, I mean, you get in there and start praying for something you expect it to happen tomorrow or just in a few minutes. But with, uh, in Genesis 3.15, I think there was 4,000 years from the time that God said that in the garden to Jesus was manifest in the temple that day. That's a long time, y'all. And down through the annals of time, prophets still saying, the Redeemer's coming, the Redeemer's coming. They had to have patience for that to happen. And so when we look at the spirit of truth or a prayer, uh, he transcends time. Things in the spirit are eternal. And so... Uh, <clears throat> uh, um, so we can get out there in the spirit and begin to see things and know things. And we've been praying a lot about that lately. Uh, Brother Hagen said that in the end uh, times that the spirit of seeing and knowing would increase upon the body. Because you're going to need to know things. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. You need to know things about your life. You need to know where to be, where to go, the timing of it. Do I stay here, sit in my car, uh, <laughs> whatever it might be. You need to know that, right? Hallelujah. So uh, number two characteristic of Simeon uh, was that he was uh, a person of the fruit of the spirit. He, ca uh, he uh, carried the fruit of the spirit. Um, the third thing was it said it was revealed to him. So it was revealed to him uh, that he would see the Lord's Christ. And so uh, prayers or people who pray or just Christians outright operate in the gifts of the spirit. So we've been looking at uh, lately John 3, John 16, 13 through 15. And one of the things he's been emphasizing to us is that the, one of the job descriptions of the Holy Spirit is that he will, he will reveal, disclose, declare, and transmit. He will. And so we have to have faith in he will. Amen. If we need to know something, he will show us. He will declare. He will decree. He will transmit it unto us. He will show. So that's John 16, 13 through 15. He will show us things to come. Um, <clears throat> and you have to believe he's going to show you. Amen. Pastor may not always be where you can get him on the phone. Your best friend that you pray with, you may not always be able to get them. But you have to know that God will speak to you. Yes. Hallelujah. 
just simple, ordinary folk, he can hear from God. This is just basic Christianity. John 16, 13 is written in general. It didn't say all you ministers get, you know, the spirit of seeing or or, uh, the Holy Spirit revealed it to, you know, the fivefold ministry gifts. Jesus is talking to the disciples. And we are his disciples. Uh, And that the word disciple means pupil, ones who follow after the teachings of their master. And so he will reveal it to you. You can know what the Holy Ghost is telling you to do. You can know what uh, the, the Lord wants you to do. And it's necessary for our life. Uh, years ago, my friend, she's in heaven now. She had lost a baby. And uh, she, w- she and her husband wanted to get pregnant again. And uh, so what they did, uh, after she, shortly after she lost a baby, she adopted a baby from one of her, uh, her cousin. And, uh, and so they, her heart was you know, towards the, you know, putting everything in this baby. And I've heard this happen uh, very often with people who were trying to have children or lost children, and then uh, they adopt, and then something happens, and then they get pregnant. So he's watching Disney. My, uh, their uh, son is watching Disney. And I think Jeremy, he was 8 or 10 at the time. So he's in there watching Disney. He gets up off the couch. He goes into his mom. He said, Mom... The Lord told me to come in here and tell you that you're pregnant and you have a baby in your tummy and her name is Jordan. And she said, Jeremy, stop that. And so he said, Mom, the Lord told me to come in here and tell you that you have a baby in your tummy and her name is Jordan. Jeremy, stop it. Stop saying stuff like that. And so she looked over at her husband. She said, you need to deal with your son. And he said it a third time, Mom, The Lord told me to come in here and tell you that you have a baby in your tummy and her name is Jordan. So she went to the doctor. She had a baby in her tummy and her name is Jordan. (laughs) So even with a child, God can speak to children. Uh, Dana Schrader, who uh, is a friend of mine, and she's uh, a person who uh, is given to prayer and teaching on prayer. She had a prayer group one time in Tulsa and uh, with children. And she was teaching them how to pray. And uh, they were praying, and uh, one of the children in the group kept saying, a shooting at the zoo. There's a shooting at the zoo. And then they began to plead the blood of Jesus over the the incident. And within a couple of days at the Tulsa Zoo, there was a shooting at the zoo. And and nobody was hurt. Uh, Everybody was uh, were fine. But children heard from the Spirit of God. And if we be like a little child... Hallelujah. We can hear from the Spirit of God, too. So, uh, so he revealed to him, uh, so it was revealed to him that he would see the Lord's Christ. So, um, so number three there, the gifts of the Spirit in operation. Uh, Romans tells us that, uh, Romans 8, 14 says, that For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So you're the sons of God, you can hear from the Spirit of God. John 2, uh, 1 John 2, 20, you have an unction from the Holy One within and you know all things. And again, in verse 27, that unction is teaching you. Number five, it says that he went to the temple. So the Spirit of God came on him for him to go to the temple. And it says that Anna departed not. You may not want that part and do that part where you don't leave the church at all. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But they were people who went to church. Hallelujah. So the characteristic of Anna and Simeon, they were people who went to church. Ten, uh, Hebrews 10, 25 tells us not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and as much, uh, so much the more as we see the day approaching. So we shouldn't be going to church less because we're pressing towards the end of the age. We should be going more. The Amplified says, not forsaken or neglecting to assemble together as believers as it is the habit of some. So it was the habit of Anna and Simeon to go to church or go to the temple. But admonishing, warning, urging, encouraging one another and all the more faithfully as you see the day approaching. So if he had not gone or listened to, you know, the, the, uh, they didn't have the Holy Spirit within, the prophet, the priest, and the king the anointing would come on them or they would know things. Uh, And so if he had not gone to the temple that day, the thing that he had been spending all this time praying for, he would not have seen. 
Hallelujah. So being in the right place. Hallelujah. I told them, I think it's during summer prayer clinic, uh, we had a young lady here in our congregation on a Wednesday night, just like this. She was tired, worked all day, and uh, getting her daughter from place to place and all of that. And so she had gone home, and as she sat down on her couch, the Spirit of the Lord said, get up and go to church. And she's like, oh, man. And uh, she sat there for a little longer and said, no, nope, uh, I want you to go to church. So she got up, came to church, and uh, I looked back because I saw the door open. I saw her come in, and, uh, and so she sat over here on this side. And, I mean, she didn't get her butt in the chair uh, for long, and then Pastor Mark started walking this direction. And he said, somebody over here in this area, the Spirit of the Lord wants me to tell you that you have been, leave, been believing in him for something and not to, for you not to let go of your faith because you're almost there. So why couldn't it just happen? He wanted her here. Yeah. And uh, the Word of God says, uh, Paul said, I long to see you so that I might impart something to you. There was something about seeing. I don't know if he saw her specific, but something over here in this section, he came towards her and gave her the word she needed. Within a few days, she had been believing God for a promotion on her job. And it, because it, they were taking so long with it, she was about to give up on it. And that encouraged her in her faith that day, and she got that job. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What if she stayed at home? She would have missed out on what God had for her that day. It may not even have that job. Maybe God could have got it to her another way, but that's the way he got it to her, by her showing up. Amen. Number six, another characteristic of people who pray or uh, prayers or uh, just basic Christian, it says, my eyes have seen the salvation. So people who pray see answers to their prayers. See answers to their prayers. So in First Peter 1, we like this scripture around here. 6, 9. Wherein ye greatly rejoice through now for, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness throughout manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold and that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory of the appearing of Jesus Christ, uh, with whom having not seen you love, in whom... Um, Though now we yet we now you see him not yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith. So we will uh, characteristics of people who pray, characteristics of those uh, who are prayers. Uh, they get their prayers answered, receiving the end of your faith. So another characteristic, uh, it said, he took up the baby in his arms and he blessed it and said. So people who pray or prayers declare and decree. He spoke over this child. They carried a spirit of faith about them. So I don't know if I was a mom and I was, had a newborn baby and a strange man walked up to me in a temple and said, hand me your baby. Maybe they knew Simeon, you know, I don't know. But, um, but when he saw him, he took him up in his arms and, uh, and blessed God and said. 2 Corinthians 4.13 uh, tells us, We have in the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore I have spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. The message says, not keeping this quiet, not on your life, just like the psalmist who wrote, I believed it, so I said it. We say what we believe. And so he blessed and declared uh, over him and decreed over him. Another trait that we see in Simeon was that uh, it said that he blessed them. Uh, and uh, so prayers or people who pray are givers. Uh, Luke 6, 38, of course, you know that scripture. Uh, I'm going to read it out of the message. It says, give away your life and you'll find your life given back. But not merely given back, given back with bonus and blessing. Given, not getting, it is the way generosity begets generosity. So people who pray or prayers uh, are givers. Uh, number nine, people who pray 
or uh, prayers served God with, it says of Simeon, he served God with fastings and prayers day and night. So we like the part of the pray, we may not like the part of the fast. Hallelujah. And Jesus said, when you fast. He said to your, his disciples, when you fast. So we are to fast. And um, uh, you want me to get right on by that one? Okay, praise the Lord. And so we'll keep going. <laughs> In Matthew 6, uh, 16, it says, Moreover, when you fast, be not as hypocrites or a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say to you, they have their reward. So if you're fasting and you're looking solemn like you're religious and, you know, I'm doing this duty for the Lord, that's your reward. You don't get the reward for what you're fasting for. You get the reward of being thought of whatever by men. But thou, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then 1 Thessalonians 5.17 tells us to pray without ceasing. All right. Um, and then uh, we see number 10. We see of Anna. It says that uh, she gave thanks to the Lord. When she saw him, she gave thanks to the Lord. Um, let me see if I can get to that scripture. Uh, verse uh, is um, Luke two thirty eight, and coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke to him of all the prayers, prayers day and night. So she gave thanks. So prayers, people who pray, uh, are thankful. People who pray are thankful, and grateful. And uh, in the First Thessalonians five eighteen, it says, "In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God." in Christ Jesus uh, concerning you. The Amplified says, is, thank God in everything, no matter what the circumstances may be, be thankful and give thanks, for this is the will of God for you who are in Christ Jesus and the revealer and the mediator of it all. So people who, uh, even in the world, they're talking about gratitude. And this is a principle, um, I think is in uh, Psalm 100 verse three, it says, be thankful and say so. Tell the Lord that you're thankful. Be thankful for the things that, you know, uh, and it says in everything, not for everything, but in everything. Whatever situation you, you get, still get, you got breath in your body, you can thank the Lord. You walk in a, you're somewhat in your right mind, I don't know, uh, you can thank the Lord. If you're walking upright, you can see it, you can drive your car, you can see you got lots of things to be thankful about. Hallelujah. You're born again, you're not going to hell with roller skates on. Hallelujah, you can't thank you for anything else. Lord, I thank you that I'm not going to hell. Amen. And be tormented day and night forever and ever. Glory to God. Prayers or people who pray are thankful. And then lastly, it says she spake of him to all that looked for redemption. And that's in verse 38. She And uh, coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who look for redemption in Jerusalem. So all of those that had been in the temple with her and Simeon praying, all of them that had heard about the Redeemer coming, all of them that had heard about uh, the, all the prophecies of one coming to save Israel, she's saying, he's it. And she's declaring that the Savior is here, the Redeemer is here. He's the one, he may not be in the form that you thought, I don't know that I would have been looking for a redeemer or someone that could save Israel in the form of a baby. Maybe a warrior, you know, with Roman, you know, all the garb on and all that stuff. Now, a baby, she had faith enough that she looked at him and knew, this is what I've been praying about. This is what I've been praying about. This is our redeemer that's coming. And so there are, you know, other things that are, I'm sure even through those passages, somebody could probably go back through there and find something. But we talked about and started out talking about all the people who played a part in the first coming of the Lord. 
uh, you know, uh, Simeon and Anna, uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth, uh, Joseph and Mary, uh, the uh, wise men, the angels uh, it were there. You know, the angelic activity was around his first coming. And I don't think it's going to be any different in his second coming. And so uh, it says in the Gospels, and Jesus says this, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? So are we preparing for him? Do we have faith that he's really coming? That there's a second coming that's going to happen? And just like we see these characters that we just read about tonight and just, you know, uh, just touched on some of them, the characteristics that they are in the preparation for the first coming is a prototype to us in the second coming. The way that Simeon and Anna were, they were devoted to praying for the consolation of Israel. They were faithful in praying for the consolation of Israel. They uh, went to church. They, uh, all these characteristics that, so as the, we see the day approaching and we just see the examples that they are, what are we gonna do? Do we really believe that he's coming back? Amen. Do we really believe that he's coming back for a harvest? It says that he has long, he's long awaited, in James it says, for the precious fruit of the earth. And he has long patience for it. So he get, you know, the, uh, pours out the, the former in the latter rain. He wants his harvest. And if we want him to come quickly and get out of this popsicle stand that we're in, we all need to be about it. Amen? Hallelujah.